So our seventh point is to ask, are the people making the claim playing by the rules of science? That is, are they using the logic and reason and empirical evidence and testing and corroboration and, and so forth? Or are they just trying to make a case for their particular claim? Next, so for example, a nice case study is the difference between UFO proponents and the members of the SETI community, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. They both are interested in aliens, but there's a radical difference in the two communities. The one community, the UFO people, they tend to not be scientists, they have no training in science, they don't do experiments, they're not trying to disprove their claim by looking for other explanations, and yet the SETI people, by contrast, they're looking for ways to disconfirm their idea, they're running experiments, they're testing their hypotheses, they're trained professional scientists, so even though they both have the same interest, are there aliens out there? They come at it at radically different perspectives, and that's why one we call science, SETI, and the other one we call pseudoscience, ufology. So the eighth point in our blown detection kit is to ask if the claimant is providing a positive evidence in favor of their theory or just denying evidence for the other theory. That is, it's one thing to, to like compile a list of problems with the other guy's theory. So you have to actually have positive evidence in favor of your contrary or heretical theory. So, for example, you often see the UFO people say, well, we don't, you know, I'll ask them, where's the, where's the evidence? Where's the UFO? Where's the alien body? Well, you know, they covered it up. They, they've hidden it. It's hidden in Area 51, or they buried the bodies in Roswell, or, you know, they're at some Air Force base. Okay, that's just negative evidence. That's saying, I, I don't have positive evidence. All I can say is that they concealed the evidence. Okay, that doesn't count. I'm sorry. They'll often hold up like these government documents with big blocked out type and go, look at that. The fact that something is covered up for some national security military reason, that doesn't mean it's extraterrestrial. There may be a terrestrial reason for that. So um, when Bigfoot people, they say, well, Bigfoot's out there. Okay, maybe, you know, there could be a bite beetle primate running around in Canada somewhere. Show me the body. Oh, well, you know, the bodies, uh, they hide and they're very secretive and uh, there aren't that many of them and so on. Maybe, but look, you want to name a new species of biology, you got to give us a type specimen. You know, an actual body that we can dissect and look at, and you can look at, and I can look at, photograph, put it in a museum, take it to the lab, and so on. It's not enough to have negative evidence against the other theory. You got to have positive evidence in favor of your theory. So on our ninth question in the baloney detection kit is, does the new theory account for as many phenomena as the old theory? Anybody can find a few anomalies that the current prevailing theory doesn't seem to account for. In other words, in science, it's okay to say, I don't know, you have a few anomalies, a few mysteries, and so on. And, uh, but what pseudoscientists tend to do is they tend to take those few handful of mysteries and say, well, that's my whole new theory. At Skeptic Magazine, we always get these long, single-space type manuscripts of a theory of everything. And it always starts off, you know, Newton was wrong, and Einstein was wrong, and Stephen Hawking is wrong. And, but I, I have worked out this new theory of physics that explains the world. But the question is, can this new theory explain all the other things that Newtonian gravity explains, and Einstein's global general relativity explains, and quantum physics explains? You know, if they explain one little thing, that's really meaningless, unless they can explain all the other stuff that's currently explained. So the tenth question we should always ask in our baloney detection kit is, do the personal beliefs and ideologies and worldview of the person making the claim, is that what's driving their research, or is it the other way around? In other words, uh, science and everything else is really it's done by people and people have biases confirmation bias we look for and find confirmatory evidence for what we already believe and we ignore the disconfirmatory evidence this is a classic case so for example uh, we did a whole issue of Skeptic Magazine on uh, global warming, and I had a left-wing scientist and a right-wing scientist and a scientist with no wings at all. And, I mean, why would there be scientists with wings, you know, political le leanings? Well, because they're people, and they vote. And something like global warming, well, you can see by just listening to talk radio and so on, this is very ideologically driven, where people, you know, say, well, we, if I'm pro-business, I have to be skeptical of global warming. Wait, how about just following the data? Shouldn't the data tell us whether the Earth is getting warmer or not? Well, it is. 
And shouldn't we be able to discern from the data whether the global warming is caused by human activity or not? Yes, we can, and it appears that it is. So what's all this politics stuff? Well, because we're people. So in science, at some point, you have to remove politics and ideology and say, what is the data? What the baloney detection kit does there with our little 10 questions is it helps us um, when we encounter a claim, think about it uh, in, in, in different ways. What you're going to find is that there's a range. Some are just obviously bogus. The Earth is flat. No, it's not. It's round. Uh, you know, the Earth is going around the sun, not vice versa. Yes, okay. There's things that we know for sure are true. Evolution happens to be one of those. Maybe global warming is sort of leaning toward that now, but it's taken a while. And there's other things like uh, maybe some radical new theories about the cosmos, whether there's multiple universes out there. Well, that's sort of more in the uncertain range. And then there's things that are almost surely not true, like, you know, psychic telepathy, where I can read your mind, that sort of thing. Uh, those are surely not true. So you get this range of probably true to probably not true. Science is the best tool ever devised for understanding how the world works. And everybody knows that because they all go to doctors and if somebody's flying at 30,000 feet in a plane, they're not skeptical of math and engineering. They know this is the best design possible, and so on. So most of us, when we're playing with our iPods or we're using our Google search engine and we're on the internet and we're watching our high-def televisions and so on, we love science, we know science works, and we know the basis of it is sound and all that stuff. It only comes to a few things, like when it comes to, you know, what's the meaning of life, or where did we come from, what does it, you know, what does it all mean, what's the future? You know, there we start to think, well, maybe I should be skeptical of science. In fact, really, science is the best thing ever devised for understanding the world, and we should love it.